Finally, there's a chill in the air and the leaves are beginning to fall. You know what that means. It's time for your October 4-H club meeting. Before we begin this month's lesson, let's first go over a few 4-H basics, reminders, as well as some exciting new activities we have coming up for you this month and next month. Here you'll find quick links to this month's 4-H newsletter, a folder containing all of our digital flyers, as well as the Google Calendar. Keep up to date with everything 4-H by checking in with these sites throughout the month. Each month, we will first recite the 4-H pledge before our club meeting begins. This pledge affirms our commitment to using the 4-Hs to make our world a better place. You guys did an awesome job learning the pledge last month, and I know you'll do an awesome job this month as well. Please stand as your club officer leads you in the 4-H pledge. Before we get into all the fun activities we have coming up this month, let's first go over a few important reminders. Pecan fundraiser orders and money are due by October 29th. Please do not bring orders and money to school. They must be turned in to the Columbia County Extension 4-H office in Appling. The top three sellers will receive 75 4-H dollars to go to either a summer camp or another 4-H activity. So keep on selling those pecans. Next, we have our two community service projects. The Ronald McDonald House Charity Pop Cap Collection is due October 29th. Please make sure that you have the pop tabs you've collected to your class by October 29th in an easy to open container like a Ziploc. The top 10 fifth grade classes to collect the most pounds of pop tabs will win a pizza party. You'll also earn 2,500 clover points per pound turned in. Next, we have our fire prevention donation drive. If you haven't already started collecting money, go ahead and start now. Monetary donations are due November 30th, and the top 10 fifth grade classes will win a cupcake party in February. Each class will also receive 50 clover points per every dollar donated. This year's National Fire Prevention Week began October 4th and runs through October 10th. The theme this year is serving up fire safety in the kitchen. Let's watch a short video about fire safety in the kitchen, as well as about the Columbia County Fire and Rescue Service. Did you know that you can make a difference in the fire safety of every room in your home? Yes, you. Get your spy skills ready. We're going to inspect your kitchen and show you what to look for to keep you safe. Ask a grown-up for help too. Whoa, can you spot any safety hazards in this kitchen? This little boy and his puppy are too close to the stove while parents are cooking. Look again. The pot handle is pointing out where someone could grab it or knock it over. What about now? This hot soup is too close to the edge of the table. If spilled, it would cause a painful burn. Is there anything wrong now? Oh no, there are no grown-ups nearby while food is cooking on the stove. If you find any of these hazards in your kitchen, ask a grown-up to fix them. Make the area around the stove a kid-free zone. That's better. No kids or pets within three feet of the stove when grown-ups are cooking. Grown-ups should always turn pot handles towards the back of the stove so they cannot be pulled down or knocked over. Hot liquids can cause serious burns. Grown-ups, make sure hot liquids and food are in the center of the table or towards the back of a counter. A grown-up should always watch the stovetop when they are frying, boiling, or grilling food and turn burners off completely if they have to step away. And don't forget, every home needs working smoke alarms. Know the sound of a smoke alarm and what to do when you hear it. Loud, huh? Make a home fire escape plan with your family and know two ways 
out of every room. Nice spy skills. Sparky would be proud of you. Go check out the safety of your own kitchen. And remember, you can make a difference. All right, here we are with engine 12. All right, engine 12 is at station 12 in Apple. Okay, now if you notice right here, we have our fire hose. This is the hose that we use to put fire down within the house. 911, what's your emergency? I need help right now. Hurry, the house is on fire. It's going to burn down. Okay, I want you to get everyone in the house. Do not go back in the house for any reason. Call us back if anything changes. We have someone on the way. I take a breath. I'm not going to lose. This is what. Hey, 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 oh, you with me? Hey, All right, sorry. stay with me now. Okay, what is it with kids these days? All right, like I was saying, there's a lot of cool reasons why you'd want to be a firefighter. Here in the T-shirts, T-shirts, get your 4-H T-shirts. This month you received a 4-H T-shirt order form. We have two different shirts, one short-sleeved hunter green shirt for only $5 and a long-sleeved maroon T-shirt for only 8 we do have limited quantities though, so please call first to check the current sizing options before ordering. We know everyone's gonna look fabulous in their new 4-H t-shirt. Celebrate 30 years of the Hubble Space Telescope by creating an amazing piece of art inspired by its discoveries. This month, 4-H is hosting the Universe of Art Contest. First, choose one picture from the link below taken by Hubble to inspire your creativity and imagination. You don't want to copy this picture necessarily. You just want to use its shapes and its colors to inspire your handmade piece of art. Next, you'll create that handmade piece of art using an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and incorporating the 4-H emblem. When you're done, enter and upload your design to the link below. More details can be found on this month's contest flyer provided to you. Deadline to enter is October 29th, and prizes from NASA will be awarded in each division, grades K through 3, 4 through 6, and 7 through 12. Before we move on, let's watch a short video about 30 years of the Hubble telescope experience. The Hubble Space Telescope has given us an incredible image for its 30th birthday. This image reveals a beautiful nursery for new stars in a nearby satellite galaxy to our own Milky Way. The bright newly formed stars in the middle of this image are at least 10 times more massive than our Sun. Powerful radiation from these stars is causing the surrounding gas to glow in stunning colors. The blue indicates oxygen gas heated to nearly 20,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The red indicates the presence of nitrogen and hydrogen. Those massive stars are also driving powerful winds of charged particles which are sculpting out the bubble and ridge structures we can see across the nebula. And it's Hubble's exquisite vision from its orbit above Earth's atmosphere that gives us the ability to get a clear glimpse of this kind of incredible beauty and activity. The Hubble Space Telescope has changed the way we think of space and our place in the universe. Hubble has refined our understanding of the age of the universe and its rate of expansion. And through its deep fields, it has peered across billions of light years to reveal ancient adolescent galaxies we can compare with our own Milky Way. It has shown Hubble is in excellent technical health and is expected to continue its exploration of the universe for quite a few years to come. Multiple astronaut missions to service the Hubble Space Telescope over the years have kept Hubble at the forefront of capability. 
With each servicing mission, astronauts repaired or replaced instrumentation, keeping Hubble better than ever before. You can find out more about the Hubble Space Telescope at the website nasa.gov slash Hubble and on social media at NASA Hubble. has another awesome opportunity for you to venture into outer space. Join us for Mars Base Camp. Explore a hands-on mission to Mars at home with the National 4-H STEM Challenge. This two-day virtual STEM activity will take place November 23rd and 24th and is open to grades 4 through 12. During this event, you will practice landing on the red planet, design and build your very own rover to keep, learn to grow food on the Martian landscape, and use the Scratch program to become a planetary scientist. The cost of the activity is only $15 and includes all of the materials you'll need to live like a Martian. Students must be able to attend both days to participate. Registration opens October 12th at 8 a.m. via Eventbrite and closes November 9th. It is best to register early though because the event is limited to the first 15 students. Check out this month's event flyer for more detail. Fall time means fair time. We all love riding the rides and eating those sweet, crispy funnel cakes. But this year, you also have the opportunity to win cash prizes at the Columbia County Fair. Registration is now open for our 4-H County Fair exhibit contests. Use your brain and your talents to enter projects in up to four categories. First, we have poster projects. Create an informative poster on any topic you choose. Just make sure it abides by the 4-H Code of Conduct. Next, we have the Recycled Project. Create a new item from recycled materials. For example, you can make a jewelry stand or a pencil holder out of two liter plastic bottles. Make sure you aren't creating art with your recycled materials. The item must have a new use or purpose. Next, we have a category for all of our budding photographers. The only requirement is that the photograph must be printed five by seven or larger and framed when turning in. This category is also open to adults. And last but not least, we have our drawing and painting project. All drawings and paintings must be mounted or framed, and any art medium can be used, such as watercolors, markers, colored pencils, graphite, etc. All entries in this category must be handmade, no digital entries. A first, second, and third place winner will be awarded in each category within each division group. We will also award one overall winner in each category over all division groups. More information regarding exhibit rules can be found in this month's event flyer. All exhibits must be registered online by October 20th using the link provided. Your entries do not have to be completed at the time of registration. After you have registered, you will drop off your physical exhibits to the Extension 4-H office in Appling on either October 21st or October 22nd, and winners will be announced on the official Columbia County Fair website and Facebook page. Did you know that 75% of all flowering plant species rely on a pollinator to reproduce? Or that there are over 20 orders of insects? This month, we will dive into the world of pollinators, insects, and the amazing journey of the monarch butterfly. You guys did an awesome job at submitting questions about last month's lesson. So before we begin this month's lesson, let's answer a few of those questions. Our first question came from Parkway Elementary School. Is 4-H only in the United States? That is a great question. Actually, there are over 50 other countries that have 4-H programs, including Kenya, Australia, and even China. You can see all of the countries that have 4-H programs by going to the map at this link. Our second question comes from Baker Place Elementary. How do you become part of 4-H at the college level? Technically, 4-H ends in 12th grade when you graduate from high school. However, there are several universities <clears throat> that have collegiate 4-H programs. UGA in particular has one of the biggest and most active collegiate 4-H pro programs in Georgia. And our last question comes from Greenbrier Elementary. Can you actually see germs with a black light? So last month we used a special black light lotion in our video to simulate the germs on our hands. So the black light can't actually see your germs. However, the ultraviolet 
black light can detect certain liquids that contain fluorescers, such as saliva, which is your spit, or blood. What is pollen? When most of us think of the word pollen, we think of allergies. Allergies are no fun, but I'm here to tell you that pollen is an essential substance to life on Earth. Pollen is a very fine powder produced by trees, flowers, and grasses that causes plants to form seeds, which then help grow into new plants. A grain of pollen is so tiny that it is best viewed through a microscope. Animals such as hummingbirds, bees, beetles, butterflies, and even bats help take pollen from one flowering plant to another. This process is called pollination, and the animals that help are called pollinators. Let's learn more about pollination and watch some pollinators in action. Have you ever heard of a keystone species? Keystone species are not necessarily the largest or most plentiful species in an ecological community, but they are the most essential. We call the bumblebee and other pollinators keystone species because they are essential to maintaining the biodiversity of the ecosystems they live in. Other species depend heavily on pollinators to help with plant reproduction, as well as to produce genetic diversity in the plants that they pollinate. Without pollinators, many of our ecosystems would not exist, and neither would many of the yummy foods we eat. Did you know that more than 100 important crops in the United States are pollinated by just the honeybee alone? 
Take a look at the pictures to the left. The top shows what the typical produce section of the grocery store looks like, and the one below shows what it would look like without the help of bees. One crop pollinated by bees is cacao. Does anybody know what comes from cacao seeds? <laughs> That's right, chocolate. So next time you see a bee, thank her for the sweet chocolate treats you enjoy. Pollinators are a great example of how everything in nature is connected in some way. The connections may be physical, such as a branch joined to a tree, or functionally connected, such as two birds communicating with each other through the pattern of their songs. From the smallest mosquito to the 200,000 pound blue whale, everything is woven into the great web of life. The way animals behave within an environment can be categorized as either an inherited trait or a learned trait. Inherited traits are those traits that are passed to the offspring from their parents. Learned traits are behaviors that animals must be taught. They are learned after birth and result from what the animal experiences during life. Traits you inherit from your parents include eye, hair, and skin color. Sea turtles also inherently know at birth to bury their eggs in the sand, and spiders know how to spin a web. Examples of learned traits include teaching a dog to bring in the newspaper, a monkey learning how to use tools to get food, and a human learning how to build a fire to keep warm. Every known living organism on Earth is classified and named by a set of rules. Those rules are used by all scientists around the planet. They do not use common names for these organisms, though. Instead, they use Latin scientific names. For example, you would tell your friends that you have a dog named Sam. Scientists might say you have a Canis familiaris named Sam instead. The taxonometric way of classifying organisms is based on similarities between the different organisms. A biologist named Carolus Linnaeus started this naming system. There are seven levels of classification. An easy way to remember their order is by using the phrase, King Philip came over for good spaghetti. The first letter of each word in the phrase corresponds to the first letter of each level. Remember, organisms are classified based on the similarities between the different organisms. As we take a closer look at the kingdom Animalia, better known as the animal kingdom, we can see that animals have been divided into two groups based on the observable presence or absence of a backbone. Invertebrates are animals without a backbone, and vertebrates are animals with a backbone. These groups are divided into smaller subgroups or phylum. Insects, spiders, and crabs are in the phylum Arthropoda within the invertebrate group, and fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals are in the phylum Chordata within the vertebrate group. Animals can also be classified by similarities like being warm or cold-blooded. Today, we'll be focusing specifically on the class of insects within the phylum of arthropods. There are several characteristics and similarities that define an insect. We already know that they are invertebrates because they do not have a backbone and that they are cold-blooded. There are many bugs that we commonly refer to as insects. However, scientists define an insect as an animal with the following characteristics. Number one, a hard external covering called an exoskeleton. This covering acts as a shield to protect the insect from predators. Number two, a pair of antenna on their head. Number three, three body segments called the head, thorax, and abdomen and finally, they must have six legs that connect to the thorax. This last characteristic is very important. It is what distinguishes insects from spiders. Spiders have eight legs, therefore are not an insect, but are in a class of their own called arachnids. Insects go through two different types of metamorphosis. 
Metamorphosis is the process of transformation from an immature form of an animal to an adult form. You're probably familiar with complete metamorphosis. It has four stages, the egg, larva, pupa, and adult. Incomplete metamorphosis has only three stages, egg, nymph, and adult. Grasshoppers are an example of an insect that goes through incomplete metamorphosis. So remember, the difference between complete metamorphosis and incomplete metamorphosis is that complete metamorphosis does not have a nymph stage. Now that you know more about insect classification, it's your turn to classify like a scientist by playing classify this. There are over 20 orders within the class of insects. Many of the names of the individual classes are based on Latin words describing a particular characteristic of the insect in that class. For example, the class Coleoptera refers to the insect's sheath wings. Coleo means sheath and tra means wings. Beetles are in the class Coleoptera. Their front pair of wings are modified to harden casings to protect the hind wings and body below. We do not have time to go over each class of insects, but we are going to focus on a special one you all are probably very familiar with, Lepidoptera, better known as butterflies. The word Lepidoptera can be broken down into two words, Lepido meaning scale and tra meaning wings. Butterflies are defined by their scaled wings as well as many more unique characteristics. We delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. Maya Angelou. Butterflies see the world very differently than we do through their compound eyes. Take a look at the top picture of the yellow butterfly. The right side is how we see and the left side is how a butterfly sees. A butterfly's vision is not only blurry, but they also see in a completely different spectrum of light called ultraviolet or UV that most other humans and animals cannot sense. Thanks to special photoreceptors in their huge compound eyes, butterflies can detect ultraviolet light. If you want to attract butterflies to your garden, make sure you plant flowers in large groups of the same color. This will help the butterflies more easily see and land on your flowers. Did you know that butterflies can't fly if it's below 55 degrees outside? That's why most parts of the US will never see a butterfly active during the winter. Do you know how butterflies taste? <laughs> well, they taste through their feet. Could you imagine if you tasted everything you stepped on? Yuck! A butterfly's taste sensors are located in their feet because a butterfly does not have a mouth like us to taste. A butterfly instead has a proboscis. The proboscis curls up when not in use and extends like a drinking straw when the butterfly feeds. The proboscis is how a butterfly drinks nectar from flowers to have enough energy to fly. Let's watch a butterfly's proboscis in action. Camouflage and mimicry are physical animal adaptations. Butterflies and moths are very good at both of these. They use camouflage as a way of protecting themselves from predators by hiding in areas that blend in with the color of their wings. Look at the picture in the top left corner. What do you think that caterpillar is trying to camouflage as on the leaf? I'll give you a hint. You wouldn't want it landing on your head. You guessed it, bird poop. Now, look at the picture on the bottom left. What is it? Is it a hummingbird? A, a moth? It is actually a moth that mimics a hummingbird called a hummingbird 
hawk moth. Unlike most moths, this one is colorful and is diurnal, meaning active during the day. Another famous mimic is the viceroy butterfly. Look at the two pictures to the right. They look pretty similar, huh? The one at the top is a monarch and the one at the bottom is a viceroy. The viceroy likes to mimic the monarch to trick its predators into thinking they are poisonous so that they won't get eaten as a snack. The way to tell the difference between the two butterflies is by a black line crossing the hind wing. Viceroys have this line and monarchs do not. Later, test out your camouflage skills by doing this month's butterfly camo activity to test out your own camouflage skills. For now, let's watch a hummingbird moth's mimicry in action. Speaking of monarchs, there might be one in your backyard right now. Monarchs are unique in that they are the only butterfly species to migrate. Migration is an inherited behavior. These butterflies know instinctually when and where to begin their migration and the route that they should follow. The monarch follows its host plant, the milkweed, north to Canada in the spring and summer as it blooms, and then migrates south towards Mexico in the fall as the milkweed blooms die back. Monarchs live in several other places around the world, including Australia and Hawaii, but overall these butterflies are quite rare. We are very lucky here in Georgia to be able to see them twice a year, once in April as they migrate north and once in October as they migrate south. As the monarch migrates north, it goes through the traditional life cycle of a butterfly four to five times. It takes a monarch on average four weeks to go through complete metamorphosis. This means it takes five generations to get up to Canada. The amazing thing is that it only takes one generation to get back down south to Mexico in the winter. The last monarchs born in Canada migrate to Mexico without needing to breed again. This means that one butterfly lives around six months instead of the typical four weeks. Every fall, as cold weather approaches, millions of these delicate insects leave their home range in Canada and the United States to begin flying south. They continue until they reach central Mexico, more than 3,000 miles away. These travelers return to the same forests each year and some even find the same tree that their ancestors landed on. These areas of trees are called overwintering areas. To the left is a picture of what the migrating monarchs look like in their native overwintering area in Mexico. There are so many butterflies that they cover the green on the trees in the pine forests and are too numerous for scientists to count by hand. Instead, Scientists use airplanes to go up into the sky to measure the butterflies by hectare. One hectare of area equals roughly two and a half acres of land. Unfortunately, monarchs are a disappearing species. Due to the changes in the climate and human-created hazards like pesticides, the monarch population has fallen nearly 80% from over a billion in the 1990s to around 200 million in 2018. That's roughly down from 18 hectares to only three and a half hectares. The good news is that great efforts have been made to start protecting these incredible insects. Citizen science organizations like Monarch Watch and Journey North encourage people to carefully tag monarchs as well as to report sightings online. The data from these activities help scientists determine the location and pathways taken by migrating monarchs, the influence of weather on their migration, as well as their survival rate. This month, you too can be a citizen scientist by participating in the Journey North scavenger hunt activity with your class. 
discover and interact with a real-time map of monarch sightings in our area. Monarchs will be in our backyard here in Georgia literally any day, so keep a watch out for monarchs in your backyard. For next month's 4-H lesson, get your rain boots on. We're going where the water flows with the Columbia County Stormwater Department. We'll review the water cycle, learn about stormwater and water pollution, and even make our own watershed. As we say goodbye, let's watch this incredible video of millions of monarchs overwintering in Mexico. Have a great month and we'll see you next time.